Hi there, this is John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. Today's episode will be dedicated to a remarkable but often overlooked figure of the 11th century, a monk by the name of Anselm, who would go on to become Archbishop of Canterbury and a doctor of the Catholic Church, Dr. Magnificus. Now, many of you are probably wondering why you haven't heard about this intellectual figure. We often think, in terms of the development of faith and reason in medieval thought, of Thomas Aquinas of the 13th century, or figures such as Bonaventure of the 13th century. We might also think of Augustine of Hippo of the late classical period, around the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. And yet, we often look over Anselm, why is this the case? After all, he is someone who is most famous for coming up with philosophical arguments which are still discussed in classrooms of theology and of ethics. Today we will be discussing the ecclesiastical histories associated with this man and the contemporary academic disputes as to whether he deserves the title Doctor of Magnificus. Now, Anselm's writings have largely survived down through the ages to the present day. Among them are two kinds of writings. The first consists primarily of sustained meditations, lengthy dissertations and prayers dedicated to issues of Christian morals and ethics. These include reflections on the nature of sin, and of course, the fact that we require redemption through the cross of Christ. Yet the second kind of writing is continually debated and discussed. This second kind can be classified as disputation, a kind of teaching device in which a person engages in dialogue to arrive at an ultimate goal or understanding or truth. We might think of the Socratic Platonic dialogues of antiquity. And among these writings are also personal letters written by Anselm, discussing private issues within the monastery, but obviously distributed uh, among his brother monks, and therefore a rather public matter as well. Yet, among these writings are several which are continually argued upon, such as Cur Deus Homo, why God Became a Man, discussing the mystery of the Incarnation, a work of Latin paradoxes called the Grammarion, which he wrote as a early, I think, 25 or 27-year-old novice at Beck, uh, a work uh, dedicated to arguing against Rosalind, a nominalist who illicitly used his teachings. This is someone who developed in the Prosologion an argument for the existence of God, simply using philosophical proofs. It is popularly called the ontological argument for the existence of God. However, Anselm himself never used this term. Yet we are also the beneficiaries of another kind of work about Anselm. Two biographies written by a brother monk named Aadmer, who followed Anselm throughout his journeys. Aadmer was an eyewitness to the events of Anselm's life. And in the Vita Anselmi, he describes in detail Anselm's journey as a young man, then as a novice, as Archbishop of Canterbury, and later on his arguments, and sometimes agreements, with the Anglo-Norman kings, William Rufus and Henry I. He also wrote a biography by the name of A History of Recent Events. Now, despite this rather dreary title, this work is arguably, in some cases, more interesting. It begins by putting Anselm in historical context. In a previous episode, we talked about the Battle of Hastings, how England was conquered ultimately by the Normans, and how William the Conqueror became King of England. Anselm had personal connections with not only William I, but also his successors. 
A recent history discusses how Anselm's life intersected with these secular concerns, with kings, with dukes, and with popes. Yet ultimately, both of these forms of biography are unique. According to one source named Staunton, a historian, they could be classified in some cases less as a traditional hagiography or saint's life and more as a form of intimate biography. Because A. Admer personally knew Anselm, much of what is reported can be seen as reliable, including many purported miracles which apparently took place. Therefore, if we take these anecdotes from A. Admer's record, we can see a few examples of how Anselm's thought developed. Anselm was born in northern Italy, in a province by the name of Aiasta in the year 1033. What is fascinating is from an early age, from the age of 15, he considered becoming a monk in a local monastery. But he did not have his father's permission to go. And after a protracted illness, he ultimately became a carefree young youth. Yet after his mother's death, Anselm returned to considering religious life. Anselm's mother must have exerted a great influence on the young man, teaching him not only the tenets of the faith, but imbuing in him a desire to follow the way, the truth, and the life. As a result, after the death of his mother, Aadmer tells us that Anselm left his family home, left his estate, traveled throughout Burgundy and the greater part of France, until he came to a great mentor, a figure by the name of Lanfranc. Now, Lanfranc is fascinating because he too would become Archbishop of Canterbury, council figures such as William I of England, and act as a guide throughout Anselm's educational life. When Anselm arrived at Lanfranc's proverbial desk, as it were, he had three roads ahead of him which he was considering. The first, to go back home, to give alms to the poor, and become almost an ecclesiastic at his own family estate. Secondly, to go to the great community at Clunay in the heart of France. Or to become a monastic, a member of a monastery at Bec. Now, Lanfranc didn't want to unduly guide his young novice friend. And in fact, he ended up bringing him to the Archbishop of Rouen, a figure named Morelius. Now, Morelius tells us in Aadmer's account that the monastic life at Beck would suit Anselm perfectly. Anselm already wanted to apparently engage in forms of dialectic and forms of disputation. And so, I believe at the young age of around 25, he becomes a novice at Beck. And there, almost instantly, Aadmer describes how he becomes an intellectual giant. One of his earliest works, the Grimerion, a work of Latin paradoxes, soon gives way to a work called the Monologan, uh, a discussion of further proofs for the existence of God, which would later come into being as a source for his ontological arguments in the Prosologio. Monks came from provinces all around the area to listen to this man engage in philosophical arguments, to try to come to rational explanations of things described by revelation in Holy Scripture. Now, as a layperson, I have to confess there is a tendency when we think of monastic communities in the Middle Ages to think of these monks sitting in perfect tranquility, isolated from the rest of the world, escaping the cares and burdens of secular life. Anybody who has studied religious or monastic history knows nothing could be farther from the truth. Often monasteries were a source of political infighting, backstabbing, arguments among those who had just joined the community. And we know that around the year 1078, due to his intellectual accomplishments, Anselm became a prior in Beck. He was unusually young for this post, and naturally, Aadmer tells us this made enemies. 
One of the ringleaders of these trying to create dispute was a young man by the name of Osborne. We know that he was a brilliant philosophical mind, a young man eager to engage in argument, and yet our English translation of A. Admir's Latin tells us that his ill character disfigured his nature. Now, Anselm could have seen this young man as an enemy, someone to isolate, someone to kick out of the inner circle of power, but instead he treated him always as a companion, as an intellectual friend, and ultimately as a student. Eventually, Osborne and Anselm became good friends. And over time, Anselm engaged in further disputation with him. But according to the Vita Anselmi, Anselm had to go through the tragic circumstances of watching his young pupil slowly die from a protracted illness. After his death, we have this wonderful anecdote in which Anselm is grieving over his young friend's loss. He is wondering whether Osborne is in heaven or in hell. And to him comes this vision where he sees Osborne surrounded by the choir of angels of cherubim and of seraphim and among the saints. And we know that Osborne, according to Admir, tells Anselm three times the serpent arose to try to seize him. And three times the serpent was driven back, but the bear keeper was given to be tamed. Now, what on earth does this mean? Well, I've offered up this anecdote because cryptic parables such as these are the literary genre or device in which A. Admir is writing. It is also the form of thinking which Anselm would have been used to. The serpent obviously is Satan. And we know that Osborne was attacked by the temptations of the world before he entered the monastic life, during his monastic time, and later during his tutelage under Anselm. And that the bear keeper is obviously a guardian angel, keeping him there in check or in line. So keeping the style in mind, it's still fascinating, though, that A. Admir's account is still very sparse and also describes Anselm involved in political arguments and concerns. We know that as a member of the clergy in Normandy, Anselm had communications with William the Duke, who would later become William the Conqueror. Around the time of William's death, we know that Anselm longed to visit him, to offer him comfort, advice, suggestions. But we know that Anselm was very ill at this point. And whether this is simply a work of apology or not, E. Admir describes this as a moment of high dramatic tension and describes how afterwards William the Conqueror's body was unceremoniously taken from the place where it had died to the point of burial. We know that whenever Anselm would arrive to the court of William, he would often find William's character changed. We know that the Conqueror was often very harsh and uh, cruel at points to many of his auxiliaries and servants. We know this from the harrying of the North. He could be bitter. And yet, at the same time, whenever Anselm would arrive, and this is a common theme throughout E. Admir's writings, all of a sudden, William would feel touched by the presence of this very holy, very direct, and in some cases, simple man. Now, we know that the great moment of crises occurred in Anselm's life. The point of highest controversy in the year 1093. By this point, Anselm had become abbot at Beck. He was living the intellectual life, the life of the spirit that he always wanted to, escaping the concerns of the world and engaging in philosophical and theological arguments with his brother monks. But across the English Channel, there was a vacancy for the Archbishopric of Canterbury. And already, many of Anselm's contemporaries, brother monks and others in the secular world, were whispering among themselves, or so Admir tells us, that Anselm would make a perfect candidate for Archbishop. But Anselm wanted nothing to do with this post, or so he tells us, again in his own writings. Yet, a figure across the English Channel named Hugh, Earl of Chester, 
wrote three times to Anselm, begging him to cross the English Channel. Why? Well, the argument from Hugh was that a monastery needed to be built on English soil. And the interests of Beck needed to be accounted for at the court of William Rufus, successor to William the Conqueror. Also, too, by the time of the third letter, after Anselm had declined the invitation twice, Hugh, Earl of Chester, claimed that he was severely ill, that he was sick. So Anselm, pressured now by even his own brother monks who claimed that they would brand him a coward if he did not go, crossed the English Channel in 1093, landed in Dover, and met urgently with Hugh. But Hugh, Earl of Chester, fascinatingly enough, had recovered from his illness. And so Anselm spent five months in England, getting matters for Beck in order. Now around this time, one of the knights who accompanied William Rufus, successor of William the Conqueror, King of England, was traveling with the king, presumably on a hunt or some expedition. And he said to the king, you know, we have this brilliant monk by the name of Anselm, abbot of Beck. He would be an excellent archbishop. He is pious, humble, and is not seeking authority or power. But William Rufus did not like the suggestion because he used the vacancy of the Archbishopric of Canterbury in order to gain financial revenues from that territory. So, using one of his more well-loved swears, he said, by the holy face of Lucca, St. Anselm will not become Archbishop. And according to a recent history, Aadmer tells us that in that moment, the great king, or the tyrannical king, was laid low by sickness and came over time nearly to the point of death. Now, exactly how and when Rufus became ill can be open to debate, but what is open to discussion and is still being discussed is what caused him then to call for Anselm. William Rufus apparently must have been concerned about his immortal soul. He had previously persecuted the church in England, seeking to dominate ecclesiastical authority from the seat of the crown. But now he had changed his mind. For being ill, he was worried about the fires of hell. He was worried about the damnation of his soul. So he commanded his auxiliaries, his servants, to name Anselm Archbishop. And in a Tidome ceremony, his brother monks carried Anselm on their shoulders against his will, all the while Anselm protesting. They dragged him into a nearby cathedral or chapel, and there carried out the ceremony, making Anselm the bishop. At the time, there's a wonderful anecdote, I believe in the Vita Anselmi by Aadmer. Aadmer tells us that Anselm said, Do you know what you have done? You have yoked a wee little lamb, feeble of age, referring to himself, with a bull, referring to the king, and that the bull would drag the lamb through the thorns and briars of the world and of politics, so that the lamb would be bloodied and brought nearly to death. This parable, or prophecy, turned out to be more than relatively true. King Rufus recovered, and he instantly began to persecute the church. Now, we must understand this development within the political context of the time. On the continent, there is something called the investiture controversy. At the heart of it was this. Who should appoint bishops in one's kingdom? Should it be the king, the sovereign, the regent, or should it be his holiness, the pope? Confusingly at that time, there was an anti-pope or an alternative pope who was anointed, I believe he was Clement VII, and another who was seen as a successful and rightful heir to the papacy named Pope Urban II. Anselm made things very difficult for Rufus by demanding that Rufus recognize Urban II as the rightful successor of Peter. Peter. 
The mere fact that Anselm insisted on these Gregorian reforms shows that he was interested in the sovereignty of the church and less with his own political concerns. You might say he might have been a little even over bombastic for ecclesiastical authorities or overly embracive for secular ones. Regardless, Rufus largely ignored Anselm's pleas and began to exert his authority. He dismissed one of Anselm's closest advisors, a brother monk by the name of Baldwin. And he demanded from Anselm, while engaging, I believe, in some military campaign, a thousand marks instead of the traditional 500. Anselm saw this as a bribe for being appointed archbishop. And so he refused to pay. When King Rufus, according to A. Admer, said he would take the original sum again, Anselm said that it was impossible to pay the 500 marks because he had already given it to the poor. Outraged, Rufus swore that he would destroy this meddlesome monk. So, at the Council of Rockingham, the members of the ecclesiastical authorities who were aligned to Rufus and the barons of England met for counsel. Ironically, the bishops who were bought out by Rufus argued that Anselm should be pressured into submission and maybe they could pressure the Pope into getting him knocked out of office. But fascinatingly, the secular barons, the earls, the ordinary laymen supported Anselm. Why is this? One can only say that they saw in Anselm a man of humility, a man of faith, and a man of God. Ultimately, things grew way too hot for this servant of Christ and his own kingdom, persecuted on every end, seen as almost a pariah. And so, he eventually stepped into exile. Rufus could not take away from Anselm the title of archbishop. Only the pope could do that. So, he was still officially archbishop of Canterbury. But while Anselm traveled around the continent, we know from A. Admer's account that Rufus took all the money, all the revenues, all the property land holdings from the Archbishopric of Canterbury. However, while Anselm was away, he met with Pope Urban II. His hands were far from idle. He wrote a defense of the filioque clause, a Latin form of ecclesiology which was at odds with forms of Eastern Orthodox theology at a time when the First Crusade was just kicking off. This would foreshadow in some ways the controversies between the East and the West throughout the Crusades. We know that Anselm was still highly valued for his disputations, and it was around this time, if my memory serves me, that he wrote works such as Cur Deus Homo, Why Did God Become a Man? But the reign of the tyrannical king, William Rufus, was not to last. According to Admer, in a hunting accident, the king was ultimately slain. And there was a vacancy now for someone to claim the throne of England. Now, William the Conqueror had had three sons. Robert, who was away on crusade, I believe, at this point. William Rufus, who at this point is dead, and of course, Henry I. Henry I arose to power and authority, and one of the first things that he did was try to send envoys to Anselm courting his favor. So powerful and so influential was this servant of God. And as a result, Anselm returned to the Archbishopric of Canterbury. But Henry, like Rufus before him, wanted to dominate using the crown as a way of potentially exerting royal control instead of the ecclesiastical authority. And so, like Athanasius of the classical period of antiquity before him, Anselm stepped into exile a second time. He would return to England again, spend many years writing in correspondence with his brother monks, becoming well known for his works of piety and of grace, for miracles, 
and for other events, and die on April the 21st at a ripe old age, being a servant of the one church he so loved. Now the ultimate question before us is, this glowing picture, and yet conflicted picture, in the writings of the Vita Anselmi by A. Admer, an eyewitness, compatible with the Anselm of Curtis Homo in his own writing. Well, in the late 1980s, controversy bloomed. An American scholar by the name of Sally Vaughan argued in a very Game of Thrones-esque Machiavellian manner that Anselm was actually less of a pious monk but was a well-intentioned politician attempting to garner authority and power through means of duplicity. Her argument was broken into three major categories. The first, Anselm was living up to an ideal tapas, what it meant to be a saint, the best among all Christian monks and religions. But that his interior life was focused on seeking gain, seeking leverage against his political opponents, particularly William Rufus and Henry I. The second, she claimed that she used, he used sorry, his friends as a form of political leverage as well, making colleagues among the barons of England so that he could exert authority against the king. And of course, to line the pockets of his monastery at Beck. And third and last of all, Vaughn argues that Anselm edited his own letters to cut out passages which she thinks may have been less favor favorable for him. And so Anselm, according to Vaughn, may have tried to doctor his own image as the saintly pious man. Against this point of view was the scholar Richard Southern, Sir Richard Southern. And I tend to agree, agree with Southern's argument. Everybody in the medieval period was living up to a topos. If you were a knight, you wanted to be the premier of chivalry. You wanted to be a Lancelot du Lac. If you were a man who was crowned with the anointing of kingship, you wanted to be the paragon of kings, a Charlemagne. And if you were a brother monk, you would want to be a saint in the great line of the ecclesiastical tradition before them. So Anselm living up to a topos is nothing new, nothing different. The second argument, which I believe Southern completely demolishes, is Vaughn's belief that Anselm cultivated friendships in order to leverage power in a duplicitous way. He refers to the fact that many Latin words for prosperity which Vaughn translates into English, are not necessarily carnal or worldly in nature, but often hold a spiritual meaning. And as a result, Anselm was concerned about his own soul. And third, the argument that Anselm edited his own letters is, according to Southern, perfectly true, because everyone, even during the classical period, such as the figure Cicero, edited their own work. This is because while a letter could be used for private publication among one circle of friends, it was still at the same time, in some cases, a public document. Anselm's writings, according to Southern's point of view, could have been disseminated without his know-it-all. Also, to Anselm may have not had a systematic system of storing his own letters. Therefore, the argument between Richard Southern and Sullivan could be summarized by this one succinct sentence. Was Anselm the reluctant saint, or was he a conniving politician? Well-intentioned, but still nefarious. And I believe if we examine the evidence faithfully, we have to agree with Southern and say that Anselm acted out of faith, hope, and charity. He protested far too long for mere appearance. All throughout his career, we have writings describing how he longed to return to Beck, to his quiet monastic life.
if Anselm was simply doing this for his show, he did it for far too long. The only reasonable explanation is that Anselm was, indeed, the figure Aedmer describes him to be. Last but not least, we must consider Anselm as, in some cases, an avatar for the medieval church. We all have a political and, in some cases, ideological axe to grind when it comes to academia, our own perspectives, our own arguments. Yet, if we just try to look at Anselm as his own man, through his own words, through his own perspectives and language, we have to confess his honesty. Yet, if you are somebody, for example, a scholar working in Reformation history, and you're looking at Anselm, then you might be tempted, in some cases, to see Anselm through the Vaughan point of view. He stands for uh, many aspects of the medieval church, which were in the past increasingly unpopular. Anselm supported clerical celibacy. Anselm was defender of a church independent of the state, not controlled by the state. And ultimately, Anselm was a figure who defended tooth and nail Western Latin Christendom and wrote extensively defending ecclesiastical positions. Therefore, we have to see him as a man who represents, in some cases, all that makes up the medieval church. It is this aspect of him which makes him, in my personal opinion, a true Dr. Magnificus. One of his favorite quotations was something along the lines of this. I do not in understand in order to believe, but I believe in order that I might understand. And some was a figure who paved the way for Bonaventure and Aquinas to discuss the vast relationship between theology and philosophy faith and reason. It is my own private and humble opinion that we would not have the rich intellectual tradition of the 13th century if it had not been for the rich intellectual tradition and spiritual giant that was St. Anselm of the 11th century. But I look forward to hearing your commentaries and for you to make up your own mind. I look forward to listening to your comments and hope to record again soon. All the best.